Asia's wild tigers are fighting for their lives. Now a small army of biologists from the Wildlife Conservation Society are leading the charge to save them. In the end, tigers have a right to survive as much as human beings. With fewer than 7,000 of the big cats left, many people think they're doomed to extinction. But these men dare to believe otherwise. So the absolute key to saving the wild tigers is protection. Three scientists with a passion for tigers. Yeah, if we can't protect tigers, if we can't save them, what can we save? The challenges are immense, but with the help of these committed individuals and their innovative strategies, tigers are fighting back. In the Russian Far East, a young tiger is on the move. He passes the sleeping village of Ternay, then heads north into the forest. Nobody sees him, but his presence hasn't gone unnoticed. Close on his trail are American biologist John Goodrich and Russian tracker Kola Rebin. They know this tiger. One of eight radio collared animals that the Wildlife Conservation Society, or WCS, are following here in Russia. Huh. Here's a nice track. So he came right down here off this hillside and uh, walked right out onto the road here and then continued on up the road a ways. Novice is a 19 month old cub and he's right at that age where he's spending less and less time with his mother, starting to move more on his own. Um, and this is the first time that he's actually left his territory. See, he walked right down this road here. That concerns me a little bit. He might run into people. He might decide to go kill a dog or something like that. There are only 350 or so tigers living along this thousand kilometer long stretch of coast in the Russian Far East. But tigers that enter villages are an ever present danger to dogs, people, and themselves. John will be watching Vaisya's every move to make sure he doesn't get into trouble. Nearly four and a half thousand kilometers to the southwest, two investigators are going undercover. Australian biologist Tony Lynham and his WCS colleague Kalia are fighting Thailand's illegal tiger trade. They've heard that protected wildlife is being sold in Bangkok's famous weekend market. To gather video evidence, they fit Kalia's bag with a hidden camera. Until just a few years ago, tiger skins and bones were openly on sale here. That business has been driven underground, but Thailand is still the hub of Asia's massive illegal wildlife trade. There are no tiger parts for sale today, but they're about to find some animals that are even more endangered. Oh, look at that. What's this one down here? Do you know what this is? Yeah, this star tortoise. That's the star tortoise. Critically endangered species. Critically endangered. Yeah. Their video footage will eventually help the forest department prosecute the traders. But tomorrow, Tony heads deep into the jungle to help stop this illegal trade at its source. More than 2,000 kilometers further west, Ulas Karanth is beginning a journey through the Badra Tiger Reserve in southern India. Ulas has been studying tigers for the Wildlife Conservation Society for more than 14 years. He knows more about India's tigers than almost anyone else. I got interested in tigers at a very young age. I was fascinated by tigers, but I was training to be an engineer. 
at that point in my career i read uh, dr george shaler's pioneering study of tigers in khana park in india it triggered this passion in me said this is what i really want to do in life so i retrained myself from being an engineer to a wildlife biologist and eventually ended up working with uh, wcs where dr shaler also works the wildlife conservation society headquartered at new york's bronx zoo uses science to spearhead its battle to save tigers biologists like ulas are at the front line gathering intelligence about these elusive big cats tigers are one of the most difficult species to study their scarcity is the single biggest reason then they live in extremely dense cover and they're very secretive they tend to avoid people so all the combination of these characteristics makes it very very difficult to study them so you're kind of clueless wandering in the forest and you have to pick on every little thing and tracks are extremely useful tools mm -hmm. for finding out whether tigers are in a place or not we see these tracks facing in all different directions and that's because the tiger has come first had a drink turned around come out and then reversed into the water to cool off for ulas understanding tigers and trying to save them go hand in hand in the last century asia's tigers have disappeared from over 95% of their former range now less than 7000 survive in just 14 countries WCS works in 10 of these from India across Indochina to the Russian Far East. Well, there are those who said in 1993 that the tiger would go extinct by the year 2000. I was one of the skeptics. I said no, that's not going to happen. Ulas knows there is no magic bullet to save tigers. Each country has to come up with its own rescue package. but he believes there is good reason for hope Ulas's optimism is based on his knowledge of tiger biology The key to understanding tiger is to know that it's a big meat eating animal and it eats about 3000 kg of live prey per year just to survive So that translates into about 50 animals the size of an axis deer or a small cow. This basic formula that a single tiger needs to eat a large animal every week applies equally in India, Thailand and Russia and it determines how much space a tiger needs to live in. Bhadra Tiger Reserve is in southern India's western ghats. These are potentially rich forests with lots of food for hungry predators. 100 square kilometers can support more than 15 tigers. A tigress might live her whole life within an area of just 10 square kilometers. Things are very different in Russia at the northern limit of the tiger's range. There, prey density is very low. To find the same amount of food, Russian tigers need huge home ranges, up to 30 times larger than their Indian cousins. Here, sambar deer, cheetle deer and wild boar are high on the list of the tiger's favorite foods. So too are gaua, up to a metric ton in weight. These wild cattle are a feast, fit for the king of the jungle. Studying prey helps Ulas and his team understand how tigers fit into the scheme of life in India's forests. It's not easy. Until recently, poaching was rife here, and the animals are very wary. Researchers Praveen and Samba are alert to any movement. This frontline survey is identifying how much food is out there for the world's largest cat. Although prey and tiger numbers are low at the moment, Ulas Karant and his team are confident that this will soon change. But is the outlook as hopeful for tigers in other countries? Thailand is a tiger country with its own unique challenges and opportunities. 
biologist Tony Lynham is on his way to a park the locals call Balahala. This rainforest is in the far south, on the border with Malaysia. It's very wet, and there isn't much food for tigers. As a result, they're rare and hard to find, as Tony knows only too well. I have not yet seen a tiger in the wild. I've come very close. I've seen their tracks, fresh tracks, tracks that were so fresh that water was still seeping into the hollows formed by the toes. Last month I got very, very close. I was probably 10 seconds away from seeing a tiger. I'm sure I've been in places where tigers have been sitting watching me, but I haven't seen the tigers because they've been hidden. Rivers are the easiest means of access in these dense jungles. During the rainy season, this river floods its banks. But this is winter, the driest time of the year. Water levels are so low, the boat can only just make it. In the last seven years, Tony has been to some of the most remote and inaccessible parts of Southeast Asia, carrying out surveys to find just where tigers still survive. Four and a half years ago, I came to the Balahala forest for the very first time. What I found here was an intact assemblage of carnivores, tigers, clouded leopards, panthers, leopard cats, marbled cats. They're all here. I was very, very impressed. I also found a prey base to support those carnivores. And what I thought I, I had here was something worth preserving. Alarmingly, Tony has found only a few viable populations of tigers in Thailand and in neighboring Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. In many places, tigers have disappeared altogether. But with an estimated 50 or so tigers, Balahala is an exception. So why are tigers hanging on here when they're vanishing from many other places? Deep in the forest, Tony has met up with an old friend and ally. Lieutenant Colonel Pitak is an officer in the Thai Border Patrol Police, and he's keen to show Tony the results of some local police work. A few years ago, wildlife protection was made one of the Border Patrol Police's official jobs. Their brand of assertive action gives Tony and his WCS colleagues hope for the future of Asia's tigers. We believe that with good protection, with good efforts, across the range of the tiger, that we can restore tiger populations. We can have 100,000 tigers, potentially. 100,000 tigers will eat a lot of meat, but that seems to be in good supply around here. Fresh guard tracks right here. And we can tracks. What's that over there? Go. The many animal tracks are a sign that wildlife thrives here. That should mean that tigers are plentiful too. But Tony is more likely to come across one of thousands of smaller species of invertebrates. This giant millipede may be harmless, but there are plenty of other small creatures Tony has to beware of, like leeches and tiny biting ticks. Blood-sucking bugs aren't the only challenge here. Rugged mountains are covered in dense forest, which is almost impossible to move through, let alone count tigers in. Wow. Being constantly wet is another of the many discomforts of this job. But it'll all be worth it for a tiger sighting. Look, fresh tracks here. That must have been, let's see, possibly yesterday, maybe, maybe last night. Fresh tracks. One, one animal's come this way. Fresh chew marks on these grass blades. Yeah, yeah, very, very fresh. Okay. Yep. 
It's a rare sight, a herd of gaua feeding in the open. Where there's gaua, there must be tigers. It's unusual in Thailand to see these shy, wild cattle in such numbers. Tony counts 19 animals, including young. Police protection is ensuring a good food supply for local tigers. But the big cats aren't the only ones feeding well in this jungle. What's that? A leech? A leech? That's a full one. A fat leech has been helping itself to a meal of blood. jungles of Thailand, it's small animals, such as leeches, that are the biggest hazard of the job. It's a different story in Russia, where people share their neighborhood with tigers. On average, we usually get maybe two problem tigers a year, and that being a tiger that's coming into a town killing dogs or killing livestock, something like that. So far this year, knock on wood, we haven't had any problem tigers. John is part of a team called in to deal with tigers that come into villages like Ternay to ensure there's no conflict between people and predators. John is keeping a night watch to make sure that the young male Vaisya doesn't enter the village and get into trouble. From his house on the hill, he can pick up the signal from Vaisya's radio collar. For the early part of the evening, the inactive signal shows Vaisya is lying down, probably asleep. Later, John continues the hourly checks from his bed. His vigil could save a life. Two years ago, a tiger walked right through Ternay it passed within a hundred meters of his house, killing and eating a neighbor's dog. By early morning, Vice's signal has disappeared as he heads away from the village. He has avoided people trouble, but John still has reason for concern. Adolescence is the riskiest time of a tiger's life. Young Vaisya could meet larger males and get into dangerous fights. Vaisya is now well out of range. Siberian tigers have enormous territories. To find enough food, they must travel great distances. Tigers can cover a tremendous amount of area in, in the course of a day. On average, they probably move maybe about 10 kilometers per day, um, but they can move 20 or 30 kilometers in a, in a 24 hour period. Uh, once or twice a week we fly in a plane in order to locate all of our tigers and that's because most of the areas that we work are so remote uh, and tigers cover such large areas that it's very difficult to find them. Many of the areas don't have any road access and to go out on foot and cover an area of say a thousand square kilometers to try to find the tiger is, is nearly impossible. The Antonov biplane has been flying since 1947. Radio tracking flights are not for the faint-hearted or those prone to air sickness, but Andre is well used to them. He's one of five Russian trackers working with John to uncover intimate details of the lives of individual tigers. The plane heads north, but quite a few minutes pass before Andre picks up Vaisya's signal. The young tiger has walked more than 10 kilometers overnight. Andre directs the pilot to move in closer for a look. 
and the plane begins to make stomach churning turns. Then he sees Paisia. This is as close as the team usually get to their study animals. John still remembers his first tiger sighting eight years before. We're flying low over this oak forest that looked like pretty much just like the forest at home in New York where I grew up, except that all of a sudden there was this tiger there. And it was amazing on, on kind of two fronts. One, it was just absolutely amazing to see a tiger, this big, beautiful orange animal running through the forest. Um, but it was also amazing to me how natural it looked and how much it seemed like you belong there. The plane leaves the young male and heads in search of the seven other radio collared tigers. They see lots of red deer. This is good news for Vaisya, who'll be hunting on his own for the first time. After five more minutes, they find Olga. And she's not alone. She has three young cubs with her. Olga's a really important animal in our study. She's been radio collared for 11 years. We captured her when she was one year old, so we know exactly her age. We know that she's 12 years old. We've monitored her through six litters. Um, she'll give us wonderful in information on the reproductive lifespan and the overall lifespan of a tiger. Because they're so difficult to study, there are many unanswered questions about tigers. How long, for instance, does a wild Siberian tiger live? And how many cubs will a female produce in her lifetime? These are basic questions, but John and his Wildlife Conservation Society colleagues across Asia are only just beginning to answer them. They have to be detectives, gathering clues to piece together a picture of how tigers live and what they need to survive. Because they work in such different countries, each biologist collects his information in quite different ways. Today, John is out to investigate a possible tiger kill. But first, he has to make sure he's not in any danger himself. So caller reported seeing some crows over here, which means we might have a kill. I just want to check and make sure we got, don't have any radio collared tigers in the area. However slim, there's also a chance that John could still be surprised by an uncollared animal. No, no signals. You very rarely see tigers, and part of the point of using radio telemetry is so that you can monitor tigers from a distance and you don't have to disturb them. So when I'm working in the field all the time, I see a tiger maybe once a month. Um, and every time it's just, it's a, such a thrill. What's the deal? When I'm following tiger tracks, and, and that's one of my favorite things to do, is to track a tiger in the snow. I do always have that expectation and hope and anticipation that maybe suddenly there he will be. Like crime scene investigators, John and Kola assemble the evidence. It points to a tiger called Valodia, father of the young Vaisya. 11.3 centimeter pad width. Got a fairly fresh tiger track. You can, you can tell that it's been since the last snow. Um, it's an adult male sized. Velodia left an area to the north um, two days ago and then disappeared. We're not sure where he is now. We can't, haven't heard his signal. Velodia is the dominant male in this area, which is why the newly independent Vaisya has left, to try and find a territory of his own. The tracks here have gotten drifted in with snow, and we've lost them, but we'll just go into the woods and look around, see if we can find them there. John and Kola hope the trail isn't about to go cold. 
Every tiger print tells a story. Really beautiful tracks. You can see how it chooses where the snow is hard so it can walk on top but it doesn't break through. John Goodrich and Kola Rebin have become experts at tracking Siberian tigers in the winter snow. Huh. Interesting, mm -hmm. So these tracks are coming up and that's because when the tiger walked through here, they packed the snow down and then when the, the wind blew the snow away, it didn't blow the pack down snow where the tiger walked. So that means that the tiger walked here in the fresh snow before the wind started blowing and blew the snow away. The pieces of the puzzle are falling in place. They know which tiger made the tracks and when it was here. Then they begin finding clues that suggest what it killed. So we've got some blood here and stomach contents um, and some hair that's either elk or sika deer. It's fairly light color, it's probably elk. The signs of life and death are clearly marked in the snow. Here the tiger dragged the elk or red deer for a few hundred meters. With every kill they track, John and Kola learn more about the habits of their tigers. They know, for instance, that red deer are a favorite prey item and that wild boar come a close second. A pile of hair and a few bones confirm their suspicions. Part of the pectoral girdle uh, can tell by the bone that it's a real young animal. So it'd be less than a one-year-old elk. So it looks like he killed it right out in the open there, dragged it in here, ate a little bit, and then uh, drug it further, probably drug it further because they don't like to be next to real open areas. Finally, they find the frozen remains. Less than 10% of a tiger's hunts are successful. This was a well-earned meal. Got a elk calf. See tooth marks right here in his throat. Pretty much everything here is eaten. Just got a pile of hide. A little bit of meat left on his neck that the tiger didn't eat. After a big meal like this, the tiger Velodia won't need to eat again for a few days. It's just as well. A snowstorm is blowing in from the Sea of Japan. There'll be no more tracking for the next few days. For a few months each winter, John has a unique opportunity to get to know individual tigers' daily habits from tracks they leave in the snow. Ulas Karanth can't do this in India's forests. Because they work in such different countries, John and Ulas tailor their research to suit local conditions. In recent years, Ulas has concentrated on the bigger picture, comparing different tiger populations across India. Luckily, tigers have some habits that help. They enjoy the easy travel that roads offer, and they mark their territories with droppings. In the process, they leave behind clues. Ulas and his team are always looking for insights into their secretive study animal. There are a variety of techniques that scientists use uh, to pierce this veil of secrecy and learn about the tigers. The most basic ones were like picking up their scats, droppings, searching the forest, looking for their kills, and you're really like a Sherlock Holmes there. You're looking at all the evidence, digging through the muck, get a few pieces of the puzzle in place. Oh. 
Looks like a tiger scat. The quantity shows that it's a tiger scat. Oh, there's a name. There's a, looks like a bear. Bears? Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. It's a, the tigers probably killed a bear and eaten it. I had to collect 1,500 of these scats and it was a terrible job cleaning it all up. But in the end, it was very useful. It may not be glamorous, but it's one way for Ulas to get a close-up look at the tiger's dietary habits. Even more of a challenge has been finding ways to count them. I got interested in the idea of monitoring populations of tigers. And this has been a very difficult challenge. Really counting tigers, you know, is more difficult than looking for needles in a haystack because they're so scarce, they're so secretive. And in a vast country like India, even in a single reserve, it's very difficult to count tigers. To maximize his chances, okay. Ulas carefully chooses a track which is likely to be a favored tiger route. No, no, you need to wrap it a little more carefully. This is a camera trap two small cameras and an infrared beam. A passing tiger triggers it to take a self-portrait, one of each side of its body. Okay, where's the other camera? Tigers are uniquely marked. I didn't have to go and paint my tigers. They had these body stripes or barcodes or whatever you call written on them. It's basically two or three things you look for. Position of the stripe on the tiger's body, its shape, and its size. Yeah. Yeah. And once you get that, uh, it's like barcoding you find on a library book. Tigers are like big barcoded library books walking around. You know, people think camera trapping is some high-tech method, and to identify tigers you have to be an expert, some kind of an Einstein. No, it's very simple. My daughter could ID them when she was 12 years old. So far, Ulas has photos of seven individual tigers from Badra. From that, he estimates the park is home to fewer than 20. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a number he expects will soon increase. But tigers aren't the only thing caught on camera. Camera trap photos also provide chilling glimpses of armed poachers. Right across Asia, war has been declared on poaching. In Thailand, Tony Lynham has teamed up with the Border Patrol Police. Pitak and Tony are heading to a conservation boot camp, where Balahala's Border Police and Forest Rangers are training for the offensive. This is one of the few forests in Thailand that has complete protection. It's very, very unusual to have a forest that is in such a good condition as this forest. Ten years ago, the Queen of Thailand asked the Border Patrol Police to protect her park. The high numbers of tigers and gawa here now are proof that their tactics work. Tony knows that the future of tigers lies in the hands of local people, such as Pitak. He said he's very proud to be working here for the Queen, to be very safe in this area. The week-long training camp that Tony and Pitak are flying to has been organized by the Wildlife Conservation Society to help its partners in the fight to save Thailand's tigers. These Border Patrol Police and Forest Department Rangers are the frontline forces. The Rangers are learning how to defend themselves and how to safely make an arrest. This could be the difference between life and death in a confrontation with an armed poacher. The Forest Department and Tony, meanwhile, are teaching the police about the illegal wildlife trade. So this is a tiger tooth. Yes, tiger. It's unmistakable, isn't it? It's very big. Very big. Very, very large. Yeah. Yes. Mm. For, mm. Not, not medicine. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, a good, oh, a lucky charm. Lucky, uh, lucky charm. Lucky. 
it may be a lucky charm, but not for the tiger. In the market, they say it's from tiger. Tiger, okay. yes, from tiger. Tiger bone. Uh, tiger bone. Okay. The demand for medicines made from tigers is driving them to extinction. Fifty baht. <laughs> That's fifty baht too. Fifty yeah. baht. And what is this now? This is tiger bone pills. Yeah, tiger bone pills. A good tonic for general weakness, muscular aches, <coughs> and take ten pills each time, <coughs> three times daily after meals. <laughs> but there is no magic pill to save tigers. Tony will soon return to the jungles, finding out where tigers still survive. In doing tiger conservation, it's important to know that there is something out there to preserve, that there are still tigers left. When we see the signs of tigers, it's a good feeling. It makes us all realize that what we're doing, the efforts that we're making, are worthwhile. The icing on the cake would be to see a tiger, but as yet, I haven't had that opportunity. Not seeing a tiger hasn't blunted Tony's passion for his work. He firmly believes that Thailand's tigers have a future in protected areas such as Palahalau. In Russia, the only major road to the village of Ternay runs right through the Sakoti Alim Biosphere Reserve. This is prime Siberian tiger habitat but a constant stream of trucks carry timber from other forests straight through the reserve. John Goodrich knows only too well that this road is very bad news for tigers. In the past 10 years, we've had five radio collar tigers poached on this road, and we've had two tiger cubs hit and killed by cars on this road. There has been no successful reproduction on this road in the past 10 years because these tigresses were killed, and they all had cubs when they were killed, and the cubs were too young to survive on their own, so the cubs also died. Got an eagle circling up here. I'm going to stop and watch him because that is often associated with tiger kills. John hopes the eagle isn't circling the body of one of his collared tigers. In the 11 years the Siberian Tiger Project has been going, some very grim statistics have emerged. Out of 22 radio collared tigers that died, 18 were killed by poachers or in road accidents. This is particularly bad news, as it's estimated that fewer than 30 tigers live in the reserve. Nobody knows how many prey animals have also been poached. It's a young male Sika deer. Uh, probably killed by poachers. Uh, it's not a tiger kill as far as I can tell. It's fairly old. It's been here for a week at least. Um, often what happens when poachers shoot an animal, if it doesn't fall down right away right next to the road, they just leave it. You know, so they probably shot this next to the road, it ran off a hundred yards, fell down and died, but the poachers already figured that they missed or because um, they're afraid to spend much time on next to the road because they'll get caught by the poaching patrol. To protect tigers along this deadly stretch of road, the Sakoti Alin Biosphere Reserve have stationed a poaching patrol here. They watch the road from a small cabin high on a hill. If they see anything suspicious, they radio through to a mobile unit. As a result, there have been no tiger deaths on the road for three years. Yet outside the reserve, Poaching is still a major threat to the 350 or so remaining Siberian tigers. John and Kola have been asked to help a young tiger. Six weeks ago, he was found severely frostbitten and nearly dead after poachers killed his mother and siblings. First, they must anesthetize the cub. John distracts him long enough for Kola to get a clear shot with the tranquilizer dart.
John and Cola have done this many times before. It's the same procedure they use to put radio collars on wild tigers. The Kruglov family have nursed the cub since he was found. Now they're keen for an expert opinion on how he's recovering. They report that when the tiger was brought to them, he was suffering severe frostbite to his feet and face. His jaw was frozen so solid they could knock on it as if it were a piece of wood. He's got an abscess on his chin from the frostbite, but that should heal up okay. While the tiger is under anaesthetic, Kola collects blood samples that will help alert them to possible diseases. One of the things I've been doing here is feeling his muscles and his bones and along his spine and his rump here. See how much fat he's got on him. He's in good shape. Good blink reaction from him, so we're going to give him a little bit more here. The cub is starting to come out of the anaesthetic. The team move quickly to give him more. Uh -huh. It's a risky business. Too small a dose and the tiger may wake up. Too large and he could stop breathing. Edward had some concerns that his, he seemed to be having some trouble with his back legs, but there doesn't seem to be any problem. He seems to be moving just fine. He lost one claw here on his back leg, but it's brought back, so that's okay. His progress is carefully documented. But there's another reason for the photos. Photos we can take um, for identification purposes. If he escapes or something and then the tiger skin shows up somewhere, we'll be able to identify it. Looks good. It's a bitter irony that photos taken to show how well the cub is recovered may one day be needed to identify his body. The checkup is complete, and John is very pleased with how healthy the cub is. His weight has doubled in six weeks. Now it's time to get him back in the cage up the hill before he wakes up. He's growling. You can feel it in his chest. We're going to have to get him in his cage fast, so get ready. With so few left, every wild tiger is important. This is one tiger encounter that John would prefer not to have had. Although he's healthy, this cub is probably too young to survive on his own in the wild. The poachers who killed his mother and siblings have almost certainly doomed him to a life behind bars in a zoo. But there is a ray of hope. Attitudes are changing. The people who first found him could have sold his body for a small fortune. Instead, they chose to save him. And in densely populated India, there is also a ray of hope for Badra's tigers. Asia's tigers and the wild places where they live have been disappearing at alarming rates. Ulas Karanth believes that to make India's few remaining forests safe for tigers, people must be kept out. This year has been a milestone for the Badra Tiger Reserve, but Ulas has to go into the surrounding countryside to find out why. Until a few months ago, 730 families lived in Badra. As an incentive to relocate out of the Tiger Reserve, the villages were offered land and new homes by the government. Ulas and Girish have been strong supporters of the relocation, 
and they're here to find out how people have found the move. Ulas understands that to save tigers it is also important to look after local people. What has happened here seems to be benefiting both. As well as new homes, the villagers now have a school and they're growing better crops than they ever managed inside the tiger reserve. He says one of the main things is the damage from animals has come down, yes. so because of that he's getting yeah. better crops. Yeah. Hungry elephants no longer raid their rice fields and sugarcane groves. Yeah. One of the things that he says they are so much healthier because they sleep a lot more, the, once they had crops there for six months a year, they couldn't sleep at night. They had to guard the crops and they don't have to do that and they're really sleeping well these days. The wild animals in Badra Tiger Reserve are sleeping more easily now too. The 16 villagers that used to fragment the park have gone and without people there will be less poaching. Ulas believes this approach is the key to saving Badra's tigers and their prey. I'm very sure that tigers can't be saved by scientists and science alone. All elements have to be in place. But what science does is channelize all this passion in the right direction. Because you can be full of passion and be doing absolutely the wrong thing. It's the knowledge that science provides that allows you to do the right thing in the most efficient way. A tigress can produce between two and five cubs every two years. So with enough food, their numbers can recover quickly. Ulas expects that in 10 years, Badra's tiger population will be three or four times what it is now. It is this knowledge which gives the Wildlife Conservation Society such hope. Tiger as a species has a right to survive because we, we didn't create the tiger, we inherited it and we need to pass it on to the future generations. There's immense potential actually. If we get our act right, I think there's a lot of room for tigers on this earth. Even in a continent that's home to more than three and a half billion people, Ulas and his WCS colleagues believe there's room for up to a hundred thousand tigers. Their ambition is to see tigers thriving, whether they live in India, Thailand, or here in Russia. Kola and Vladimir are returning from another day's tracking. It's been a good winter. All the Siberian Tiger Project's radio collared tigers have survived. No problem animals have come into villages. And there's more news. After a few days on his own, the young male, Vaisya, has returned to the security of home. They were just tracking Vaisya, who apparently came back across through Turnay last night and then came down here and was looking for his mom and his sister, and he was following their tracks. We come to these places where the, the wind had blown the snow clear, so Vice would lose the tracks, and found a tree that his mom marked, and found the tracks again, then he'd lose them and look and look. And, um, but eventually they, they met up, and they're all together now. In a country where so many tigers are killed by poachers and road accidents, it's a rare thrill for John to see a tigress raise two cubs to adulthood. His work has shown that Siberian tigers need such big territories, it's just not possible to fence them in. In this vast wilderness, people must be willing to live alongside tigers. But John is positive. There is a tremendous amount of very wild and pristine habitat in the Russian Far East. So I think there's a lot of hope for Siberian tigers. Tigers are these magnificent animals, and, and they're one of the most well-known, most charismatic animals in the world. Everybody knows what, what a tiger is. Um, and if we can't protect tigers, if we can't save them, what can we save? From the snows of the Russian Far East to the humid jungles of Thailand and the dry forests of India, the challenge is the same. To give tigers food, room and protection to ensure they have a future. Each country is tailoring its own rescue package to suit local conditions and Wildlife Conservation Society biologists are leading the charge, united by a common passion, to give tigers a fighting chance. <laughs>